Welcome to the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. Today we will be reading Neville Drury's The Shaman and the Magician, Journeys Between the Worlds. We're going to start on page three under a section called The Cosmos and Its Denizens. In the sense that the shaman acts as an intermediary between the sacred and profane worlds, between mankind and the realm of gods and spirits, he has special access to a defined cosmos. The actual cosmology, in terms of levels and hierarchies, may be reasonably basic, as it is with the Australian Aborigines and many South and Central American tribes. Or it may be complex and highly structured, as it is in the case of Siberian shamanism. For example, the Hevaro believe that all knowledge pertaining to Sinsek, or magical power, derives from the mythical first shaman, Suni, who is still alive today. He lives underwater in a house whose walls are formed like palm stobs by upright anacondas and sits on a turtle, using it as a stool. He is said to be white-skinned with long hair, and he supplies privileged shamans with special quartz crystals, sinsac, which are particularly deadly. No shamans are able to stand up to or overcome Sunni. The sky god of the Wirajiri medicine men of western New South Wales has a comparable function. Known as Baemi, he is described as a very great old man with a long beard, sitting in his camp with his legs under him. Two great quartz crystals extend from his shoulders to the sky above him. Baemi sometimes appears to the aborigines in their dreams. He causes a sacred waterfall of liquid quartz to pour over their bodies, absorbing them totally. Then they grow wings, replacing their arms. Later, the dreamer learns to fly, and Baemi sinks a piece of magical quartz into his forehead to enable him to see inside of physical objects. Subsequently, an inner flame and a heavenly cord are also incorporated into the body of the new shaman. The Mazatec Indians of Mexico, meanwhile, have been exposed to Christian influence and such elements have entered their cosmology. While the indigenous component remains, the Mazatec makes use of psilocybin mushrooms and the female shamans use this altered state of consciousness to determine the cause of sickness. On a local level, they believe that the groves and abysses are inhabited by the little people or dwarves known as the La'a, but they have also assimilated into their belief systems Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary. Among the Mazatecs, both the patient and the shaman take the sacred mushroom so that the sick person may hear healing words which come from the spirit world and thereby share in the cure. Mun reports that as the shaman sinks deeper into the trance, she may go on a journey. She mutters, Let us go searching for the path, the tracks of her feet, the tracks of her nails, from the right side to the left side. Let us look. After several hours, she appears to reach a peak. There is the flesh of God. There is the flesh of Jesus Christ there with the virgin. But if such shamanic pronouncements seem reasonably orthodox, they may often be infused with magic. Another Mazatec ceremony includes the following. The aurora of the dawn is the coming and the light of day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, by the sign of the Holy Cross, free us, our Lord, from our enemies and all evil. I am he who cures. I am he who speaks with the Lord of the world. I am happy. I speak with the mountains of peaks. I am he who speaks with the bald mountain. I am the remedy. I am the medicine man. I am the mushroom. I am the fresh mushroom. 
I am the large mushroom. I am the fragrant mushroom. I am the mushroom of the spirit. Invariably, the shamanic process entails direct contact and rapport with the gods and goddesses who provide their followers with first principles, with a sense of causality, balance, order, and with it, healing and well-being. Especially among American Indians, for example, the Desana group of the Eastern Colombian Tucano. We find a strong identification of the shaman's vision with the primal reality of the cosmos. On awakening from the trance, the individual remains convinced of the religious teachings. He has seen everything. He has seen Vaimas, master of the game animals, and daughters of the sun. He has heard her voice. He has seen the snake canoe float out through the rivers, and he has seen the first men spring from it. The concept of a system of rivers or an ocean of being from which the universe derives is also a common mythological element in several unconnected cosmologies in both simple and complex religions. Quite aside from the shamanic accounts, the idea also occurs, for example, in the creation of the Babylonians and in Jewish Kabbalistic mystery teachings. Among the Evenk of Siberia, the universe is thought to have been born from a watery waste. Rivers feature predominantly in Evenk mythology, and the shaman's helper spirits are often water birds, like the duck or golden eye. The Evenk universe is a characteristically shamanic one, in the sense that it conforms to the normal Siberian pattern of being, divided in three worlds upper, middle, and lower, vertically aligned around a central axis or world tree. The Evenk lives in the middle world. His options are upward towards the benevolent sky dwellers, or downwards towards the world of the dead, the spirit ancestors, and the mistress of the underworld. This dualism is reinforced by the fact that the term for the upper world, Uga Buga, has a linguistic origin in a phrase meaning toward morning, while that of the lower world, Girgu Irgubuga, means towards night. The Evanks believe the sky dwellers in Ugabuga live a life comparable to that found in the middle world, except on a more exalted level. For example, Amaka, who taught the first Evenks how to use fire and make tools, is thought to be a very old man, dressed in fur clothing and living among treasures, gold, copper, and silver. Around him are large herds grazing in lush pastures. Other prominent Evenk deities include Ikshire, supreme master of animals, birds, and fish, and ruler of fate. Local spirit rulers on the hills, rivers, and streams are subservient to him. He labors on behalf of the Evenks, gathering heat for them, and as spring comes, his sons carry his bag and shake out the heat upon the middle world. Kergu Ergubuga, on the other hand, represents a world which is quite the reverse of man's. Living things become dead there, and the dead come alive. Animals and beings, which were resident in the lower world, become invisible if they transfer to the middle plane, and accordingly, shaman heroes, who venture down into the underworld, will be seen only by the shamans of that region. In the Evenk underworld dwell deceased kinsmen and the spirit of evil and illness. The deceased continue to lay their traps there and to fish and hunt but their bodies are cold and lack their life essence of the middle world. Meanwhile, the ancestor spirits who reside there are only half human and are linked with the totemic reincarnations. The possibility of a transfer of plane does exist, however, and this is the shaman's role. The role which leads into the heavenly vault is guarded by an old woman, the mistress of the universe, and she is sometimes visualized in an animal slash human transformation with horns on her head. Her task at the entrance to heaven is to point the way to the dwelling of the ruler of the heavenly light. A similar female deity also guards the animals of the clan lands 
below the earth. In order to ensure a satisfactory hunt, the shaman journeys down below the roots of the sacred tree to visit her, aided by spirit guides who help him overcome various obstacles which impede his path. He encounters the clan mistress and begs her to release animals for the hunt. She may be withholding animals from the middle world because vital taboos have been breached. The shaman seeks to capture from her magical threats which he hides in his special drum. When he returns to the middle world, he shakes these forth from his drum indicating that these threads will in turn transform into real animals. The symbolic tree is a vital pillar in the cosmology, for it connects the three planes of reality. The crown of the tree reaches into the heavens, the trunk sustains the middle world, and the roots extend down into the underworld. The shaman's drum is often made from the wood of the cosmic tree, and thus symbolizes his journey upon it. The Chumakan and Upper Zaya Evanks specifically identify the tree with the source of life. Man was born from a tree. There was a tree, it split in two. Two people came out. One was man and the other a woman. Mercier Iliad, meanwhile, identifies the tree as a major motif within shamanism. The central practice, he writes, is to climb the axis of the world on an ecstatic journey to the center. In this sense, the center is the cause of all being the origin and source of explanation for all that happens in the waking world. It is interesting that both the mistress of heaven and the clan mistress of the underworld resemble each other with dualistic connotations, so that what is above and below are also, so to speak, twin sides of the coin. While several anthropologists have sought to identify shamanism with hunting practices, Iliad notes that the essential nature of shamanic cosmology is much more broadly based. Although the shamanic experience proper could be evaluated as a mystical experience by virtue of cosmological concept of the three communicating zones, this cosmological concept does not belong exclusively to the ideology of Siberian and Central Asian shamanism nor in fact to any other shamanism. It is a universally disseminated idea connected with the belief in the possibility of direct communication with the sky. The shaman transforms a cosmotheological concept into a concrete mystical experience. Only for the shaman is real communication among the three cosmic zones a possibility. Since the shaman's role is to travel from one cosmic zone to another, it is not surprising that his entire function as a technician of the sacred should reflect the nature of the gods with whom he is dealing. The shaman characteristically seeks to act in a matter which is appropriate to the domain he is entering. Although he is often accompanied by animal spirit guides, the shaman may, for example, transform into an animal on his journey. The Japanese shamans observed by Carmen Blacker characteristically wore a cap of eagle and owl feathers, their cloaks adorned with stuffed snakes. These all resolve into means whereby passage from one world to another is facilitated, the magic clothes and instruments of which the drum is the most important, embody in their shape in the materials of which they are made, in the patterns and figures engraved upon them, symbolic links with the other world. Iliad similarly notes that by donning sacred costumes, the shaman transcends profane space and prepares to enter into the sacred world. The Yakut shaman wears a kaftan that bears a solar disk which is sometimes thought to be the opening through the earth which the shaman uses to enter the underworld. The coat of a goldy shaman, meanwhile, bears motifs of the cosmic tree and animals like bears and leopards, as well as a central sun. 
Other costumes similarly reflect the prevailing mythology. The Buryat costume is heavily laden with the iron ornaments which symbolize the iron bones of immortality, while the bears and leopards, serpents and lizards which appear on it are the shaman's helping spirits. If the shaman should seek to identify strongly with the spirit realm is to be expected, his altered states of consciousness entails a transfer of awareness to a dimension where the ancestral myths become experiential realities in trance. The shaman's costume links him with the gods and identifies him as belonging with them as an appropriate intermediary. The shaman's drum deserves special mention. On a physical level, its rim is invariably made of wood from the world tree, and its skin is directly linked with the animal the shaman rides into the underworld. The anthropologist Potapov discovered that among the al Ite, the shaman's drum derives its name not from the animals whose skins are used in the manufacture, but the domestic animals ridden by the shaman in the middle world. In many shamanic cultures, the drum is the steed, and the monotonous rhythm which emanates from it is suggestive of the galloping horse on a journey. On a contemplative level, the sound of the drum thus acts as a focusing device for the shaman. It creates an atmosphere of concentration and resolve, enabling him to sink deep into trance as he shifts his attention to the inner journey of the spirit. Erica Bourgeois Non notes that drums, dances, etc. shut out mundane matters and help individual concentrate on what is expected of him or her. During Haitian voodoo sessions, the spirits are called by means of drum rhythms, songs, dance, and ritual paraphernalia, and given persons may respond to these cues by going into an altered state and acting out the appropriate spirit role. The use of psychedelics is a frequent but non-essential aspect of shamanism. As Schultz points out, psychedelics act on the central nervous system to bring about a dreamlike state marked by extreme alteration in the sphere of experience and perception of reality changes even of space and time and in consciousness of self. It is of interest that the new world is very much richer in narcotic plants than the old and that the New World boasts at least 40 species of hallucinogenic or fantastic narcotics, as opposed to a half a dozen species native to the Old World. Among those drugs which have a shamanic base are the drugs Anasteriopis capi, known variously in the Western Amazon as Ayahuasca, capi or Yaje, the Tura, which is identified with the American Southwest and Mexico, as well as among tribes in Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Mezcal beans, used in red bean dance of the Plains Indians. The Morning Glory, or Ulquí, used in curanderos in Huaca. The peyote cactus, used by Mexicans and North American Indians. And the psilocybe, Mexicana, as important narcotic mushrooms used once again in Oaxaca. Michael Harner has pointed out that common themes emerge, for example, in a cross-cultural examination of South American Yahe experiences. The drug is capable of causing the sensation of aerial flights and dizziness, and visions of exquisite cities, parks, forests, and fantastic animals. It is common for the drug to suggest the flight of the soul in the participant. According to Harner, the Hivaro actually refer to the soul flight as a trip, while among the Conibo Shipibo Indians of eastern Peru, the ayahuasca experience allows the shaman to leave his body in the form of a bird, capable of killing a distant person at night. On other occasions, those shamans also endeavor to recapture souls lost in sickness from another shaman. The shaman among the Quio is able to perceive magical darts thrown by other shamans and which cause illness and death. And the Konobo, like the Hivaro, 
believe that ayahuasca enables them to enter into the supernatural realms of the world, where they will see demons in the air and other spirit entities. Reichel Dolmotov has described the inner weavings of the hallucinogenic drug with a shamanic and mythic context. Among the Tukano, the Yahi plant was created in the mythical beginning of the world and therefore has sacred status. The shamanic function is to allow the participants in ritual to return to the uterus, to the fons et origo, of all things, where the individual sees the tribal divinities, the creation of the universe and humanity, the first couple, the creation of animals and the establishment of the social order. According to the Takano, after a stage of undefined luminosity of moving forms and colors, the vision begins to clear up and significant details present themselves. The Milky Way appears and the distant reflection of the sun. The first woman surges forth from the waters of the river, and the first pair of ancestors is formed. The supernatural master of the animals of the jungle is perceived, as are the gigantic prototypes of the game animals. The origins of plants indeed, the origins of life itself. The origins of evil also manifest themselves, jaguars and serpents the representatives of illness, and the spirits of the jungle that lie in ambush for the solitary hunter. At the same time, their voices are heard, the music of the mythic epic is perceived, and the ancestors are seen dancing at the dawn of creation. Gordon Wasson, who pioneered the anthropological study of mushrooms, has more recently studied the Mazatec's use of oliqui, seeds, and psilocybin. He was intrigued to discover that in the merger of Christianity and native beliefs, the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation had a psychedelic reality. In an address to the Mycological Society of America in 1960, he said, The Aztecs before the Spaniards arrived, called the sacred mushrooms Tionanactal, God's flesh, I need hardly to remind you of the disquieting parallel, the designation of the elements in our Eucharist. Take, eat, this is my body, and again grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son. But there is one difference. The Orthodox Christian must accept by faith the miracle of the conversion of the bread into God's flesh. That is, what is meant by the doctrine of transubstantiation, by contrast, the mushroom of the Aztecs carries its own conviction. Every communicant will testify to the miracle that he has experienced. Wasson, who is noted for his identification of Soma in the Indian Rig Veda with the hallucinogenic mushroom Amanita muscaria, has published his views that the Eleusian mysteries similarly had a hallucinogenic component. Wasson was impressed by the fact that Plato had drunk the sacred potion in the temple of Eleusis and had spent the night seeing the great vision. Wasson proposed to investigate whether Plato's and others' visionary experiences might not have been some form of shamanic exercise. Plato, for example, outlined in The Republic, his views on the ideal world of archetypes, where the original and true factors of life had their origin. Working in conjunction with Albert Hoffman, who first synthesized LSD, Wasson now believes that the vision of Eleusis were caused by the ergot fungus presented in the wheat and barley crop. Demeter's temple was located close to the extensive wheat and barley field of the Rurian Plain and the mysteries express a spiritual rebirth cycle linked closely with Demeter and Persephone's association with wheat and barley. The initiates assembled in the Telestrion and experienced a visionary illumination, but Wasson believed that the archaeological remains suggest this was not a theatrical performance. What was witnessed there was no play by actors, but phasmata ghostly apparitions, in particular the spirit of Persephone herself. 
He notes that the poet Pindar and the tragedian Sophocles testified to the value of what was seen at Eleusis. There were physical symptoms, moreover, that accompanied the vision, fear, and a trembling in the limbs, vertigo, nausea, and a cold sweat. Then came a vision, sight amidst an aura of brilliant light that suddenly flickered through the darkened chamber. The division between earth and sky melted into a pillar of light. These are the symptomatic reactions not to a drama or ceremony, but to a mystical vision. And since the site could be offered to thousands of initiates each year, depending on schedule, it seemed obvious that a hallucinogen must have induced it. Using evidence based on the Homeric hymn to Demeter, Wasson concludes that the sacred potion contained barley, water, and a fragrant mint called Blechen. Since this mint is not psychoactive, Wasson believes that the barley was the source of the psychotropic element and therefore opts for ergot of barley as the vital ingredient. The shamanic flight in ancient Greece was not always precipitated by hallucinogens. However, but generally speaking, such accounts retain comparable themes. This in itself suggests that hallucinogenic drugs as such are only catalysts for these experiences and do not in themselves produce the cosmological content in the shaman's altered state of consciousness. A detailed account of a non-hallucinogenic trance journey which survives from this period is that of Aristius of Proconesus, who is mentioned by various writers including Herodotus, Pliny, Suidas, and Maximus of, of Tyre. Pliny's description is reminiscent of Central and South American shamans, particularly and also Carlos Castaneda's vivid account of shaman transformation into a bird form. Pliny writes, The soul of Aristius was seen flying from his mouth in the form of a raven. Maximus confirms this in more detail. There was a man of Brokenesses, whose body would lie alive, yes, but with only the dimmest flicker of life, and in a state near to death. While his soul would issue from it and wander in the sky like a bird, surveying all beneath land, sea, rivers, cities, nations of mankind, and occurrences, and creatures of all sorts, then returning into and raising up its body which it treated like an instrument. It would relate various things it had seen and heard in various places. Aristius' account of his trance wanderings are contained in his poem, Arimaspea, which has come down to us in fragments. It details his trance journey beyond Scythia to the land of the Isidonians, and then over the snow-clad mountain ranges towards a golden treasure guarded by griffins, sacred to Apollo, the sun god. The poem thus merges geographical components with mythological ones, and according to Maximus, Aristeus, in his transcendental state, had a much clearer view of heaven than from below on earth. Aristeus is thus a classical Greek shaman who, like the Siberian trance specialist, was able to gain special knowledge from his visionary journey. Irrespective of individual cultural factors, then, the common component of a shamanic experience is the altered state of consciousness brought about by techniques causing some degree of psychic disassociation. In this sense, it is vital to consider the various methods of trance inducement because they are an integral part of the shaman's journey towards self-transformation.